Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever it is that you are and wherever you may be. Thank you very much for making us a part of your day. I am Brad Franklin, the creative content writer here in Chesterfield, and I'm very glad to tell you that Chesterfield Behind the Mic is on the air once again. You know, there are lots of things in, in our communities nowadays that do a lot of different things and a lot of, um, a lot, they check a lot of boxes. And I don't know if there's a single one that checks as many boxes as the library does in this day and age. And it's, and it's fascinating if you think about all the different things that the library does and the fact that we haven't had anyone from libraries on the show yet is regrettable. We're going to fix that today. I'm very happy to welcome Carolyn Sears, who is the assistant director of the Chesterfield County Public Library. Carolyn, how are you? I'm wonderful. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much for joining us, and, and I appreciate your time. Obviously, like I said, this is, uh, um, I mean, in this day and age, it's just fascinating to me to think about the differences between wh- the way libraries used to be, the way we used to see them, the way we used to use them, and then the way they are now. And yeah, it's 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 kind of messed up, right? <laughs> we haven't had you guys <laughs> in on in a good yet. way. And, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, good I was, no, no, I was saying this is just kind of messed up. We haven't had you on because of all the different functions that you guys serve. And so I kind of want to walk through a little bit of that today. Before we get started on that, I, I always like to sort of begin with an intro. Um, and I kind of want to hear a little bit about sort of your background and how it is that you came to be the assistant director here um, for the library and and sort of what, I don't know, what brought you to the table across from me today. Yeah, I would love to share with you. Um, so yes, I'm the assistant director of the library system right now. Um, I've been with Chesterfield County Public Libraries for, gosh, about 16 years now. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I started as a um, assistant manager at La Prade mm-hmm. all those years ago and just kind of worked my way through the system. Um, but, you know, the library has been a part of my life forever. Um, for, you know, for as long as I can remember, my mom would bike me up to our local library in New York okay. um, every week on the back of her bike. Okay. Uh, and so we get check out that stack of picture books, uh, yeah. you know, and um, it was just amazing. You know, I come from a working class family, no one had ever been to college. And I really do think that the library was such an influence in my life that right. I was able to see kind of past that world I grew up in. Right. And um, yeah, so went from there, started as a page at New York Public, which is shelving books, which I think is the best job in the world. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like you get to touch all the books, you right. know, and right. see them all. Um, and just kind of just kind of went from there and the the library I've always I've always had a love for for libraries and what libraries represent to the community yeah now I, I, before we move on I really get, now have to ask you so when you're growing up and you're and you're you know living that library life and you're getting that start did you ever think that you would kind of continue on the path that you you went on or did, was that sort of a a thing that sort of just happened as you went? That's a, that's a actually a really good question because I think when you talk to most librarians, they don't necessarily see themselves as a librarian mm-hmm. immediately. Right. You know, they, they, they love the library and they grow up in the library right. and they see themselves doing something else and they get experience doing other things. You know, right. I went, I got a master's degree in philosophy. I thought it was going to be a philosophy professor, you know, a very practical um, right. pathway there. Yep. Um, you know, but we just find our way back to libraries yeah. when we, when we kind of think about what do we love to do what do, and when you think about the books and you think about the people and helping people it just it just kind of like calls calls people yeah uh, it's calling yeah. really yeah it's fun mm-hmm. so in terms of uh the library here in Chesterfield I, I kind of want to I thought a good place to start might be to give people a sense of scope because as we kind of talk about some of the programming and the things you guys do both from an everyday standpoint and from like the special sort of events and things that you guys plan I, I think it's good to sort of get a feel for just what the library system is, because I think for a lot of people, they don't really even know the, the, the sort of degree of magnitude of the resource that is available to them in, you know, a variety of different ways. Talk to me, talk me through sort of the, like, I don't want to say necessarily like just check off all the, you know, every single location and such, but I, I think it's good for people to understand sort of what the library is and what um, what that scope is like. Yeah, I, I agree. So so let me tell you a little bit about the library. We, so we've got 10 locations and they are strategically placed throughout the county. Right. So we, we want everyone to be able to be in pretty close proximity to a, a location. They don't have to drive all over the county. Right. So we've got the 10 locations. Um, the And you're right, that just the sheer volume, I don't think people appreciate. I mean, we have over a million physical checkouts per year. That's wow. a, a million. Mm-hmm. And that's physical books. And right. that's first time checkout that doesn't include renewals doesn't include ebooks when you layer all those things in, you know, you're, you're getting close to 2 million. Yeah, right? for sure. So that's crazy. Yeah, I know it's, it's a lot. I mean, people love it and they use it. Um, we have over 500,000 print 
volumes in all okay. of the libraries. Um, we had over 750,000 in-person visitors last year. That's people walking through the doors. Um, and that just when you think about kind of the level of busyness, if you want to average it out, that's there's about 7,000 items checking out on average per day okay. across the county. Wow. So, yeah. So it's it's continual. People are using the library. People love the ebooks, but they also still love the print books. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting too about folks who who read is is a lot of the times you hear very um, passionate arguments either way, mm-hmm. but the fact is that they they have the arguments, which is a, a great sign of like you said that sort of constant um, use, right? Whether that's the the the, the electronic version or the um, the hard copy paperback sort of situation. Mm-hmm. Now, in terms of programming, as somebody who who has a, a, a product. We, we do a weekly segment this week in Chesterfield, which by the way, if you're listening to this and you're not subscribed, you should go do that. Um, where we talk a lot about sort of the things that are happening. And we were talking off air just a minute ago about the, just the sheer magnitude of what is going on at the library because it's, and this is, this is going to be a theme um, spoiler alert for those of you listening and watching, because the, one of the things that has really struck me about the library is that there's just always more going on even more than I thought I knew. And, you know, along the way, I feel like I've learned a lot, especially doing uh, This Week in Chesterfield. Talk to me about sort of the that everyday programming. What are some of the examples of the kinds of things that you guys offer kind of regularly? And we'll get to the special stuff in a minute, but just, I'm thinking like just your your standard sort of Monday through Friday or through the weekend really uh, on, a, on a regular, you know, just a regular Tuesday, that kind of thing. What's, what's a regular week like for you guys? Yeah, so there there is a wide variety of programming just regularly, even about mm-hmm. the special programs. So you'll have things like um, like story times, like book groups. Um, you know, you'll have special kind of um, programs for the kids. We do right. a lot of kids programming. We right. try to have a couple of programs going on at any given time um, right. for that. And they, those tend to be uh, about learning. They tend to be experiential, kind of hands-on, you know, getting getting kids and people engaged in learning, but in a fun way. Right. You know, we're not trying to be the schools. We're not trying right. to be formal about it. We just want people to develop a love of learning. Right. And in terms of the the different things that you offer at the various locations, are some of those things kind of driven more so by the communities that those libraries are in? How do you sort of decide, hey, this works well for these libraries, but maybe this other thing works better for these? How do you sort of balance those things out when it comes to a um, to a network, so to speak, a, a whole system as as large as yours is? Yeah, I, th- that's a great question too. I, I think we're very good at that. It's it's one of our strengths. We have a number of ways of doing that. So mm-hmm. we pay attention to kind of like data and demographics and, and um, checkout habits and program right. attendance habits at a system level. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we kind of look at that and we break it down. We're very good at using our data. Right. Um, but then we're also very good at listening to our branch managers right. at the locations because they're the ones who are seeing the people coming right. in every day, seeing what's appealing, what's resonating. Hearing from those folks what they'd Hearing like you from know them, yeah. exactly going out into their communities mm-hmm. and seeing the kinds of things that appeal to them even outside of the library right. and then kind of bringing that back in yeah. so we're very thoughtful about it now in terms of the same I, I would imagine the same sort of thing works when it comes to that special programming so you're talking about the different um series with authors you're talking about sort of i know there's like a lot of space related stuff mm-hmm. which as a kid who would who loved space like i mean just thinking about you know being a kid who had had those resources and those opportunities is just awesome. Talk to me a little bit about sort of these types of special programming. How what what are some of the uh, the things that are that you guys offer and sort of how how those decisions are made in terms of what is offered and where and, and when and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So so yeah. Let's talk about um, let's talk about the space programming first. Since okay. You brought it up because we're very excited about that. Um, so that's a whole um, couple of months of programming mm-hmm. and and you know part of it is like our staff are knowledgeable about certain things and they see opportunities and they get super excited about right. it. Right. And yeah. so like this is kind of focused at Meadowdale and at Ettrick and it's funded by um, the friends of the libraries there and um, you know it's like. What better way to get kids interested in STEM kind of learning right, yeah. than to do it through kind of like the space stuff that's yeah. been in the news so much lately yeah. and it's kind of so highlighted. And it feels like almost like it's coming back in a way. Right. You mm-hmm. know, there was like a lull there where it was like, okay, we went to the moon, 
We figured out some stuff and then there was like a lull and now it's like, oh, wait a minute. What if we did it differently? And there's like all these like exciting possibilities, it feels like in space. Right. Yeah. And and the learning behind what goes into it. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, we're having programs where, you know, kids can actually see a real spacesuit. Or, right. You know, they can go on a field trip and, and to the science museum and right. learn more about it. So so it's it's again, it's that value added kind of learning experience right. that it that makes it fun and, mm -hmm. and really engaging. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to have some of that coming up. We also as you mentioned, have the author series. Um, and so we have authors coming in like really big name authors yeah. that people are very excited to see. Sometimes we have, we uh, partner with the Perkinson Center for the Arts, right. which is what we're doing for our author coming up um, in June. And the great thing is we have space there. We have a beautiful facility there. Um, we've got a New York Times bestselling author coming in who is also going to be signing books. Cool. Um, and if people, you know, if they join the Friends, they actually get to go to a pre-artist um, a, a re reception, oh, great. you know, and meet the yeah. meet, meet the author. That's awesome. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So so that's very exciting. And, and people love meeting the author yeah. and getting that book signed. Like yeah. the lines are out the door yeah. all the time. Yeah. I can totally, I can totally see that. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the summer learning program, I know that's a big piece for you guys, especially this time of year, you know, summer, it, it, it might not feel to folks who are listening to this. I mean, summer's going to be here soon. It's been a little chillier this spring, but summer will be here. And that learning program is essential because I know for you guys, the idea to sort of, you know, as you mentioned earlier, you're not trying to replace the schools. What you're really trying to do is just kind of build in that sort of love of learning, that constant um, desire to learn and that, that building that sort of summer, um, that summer piece for, for the kids to sort of uh, fill that gap, right? Mm -hmm. That reading gap between when school ends and when school starts in the fall. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about the summer learning program and, and what you guys have going on this summer. Yeah, so so you're exactly right. During the summer, I mean, studies show over and over again that there is a slide. There is a learning loss yeah. that happens, absolutely. And um, one of the ways, one of the best ways that parents and caregivers can combat that is by engaging their kids in learning experiences. It doesn't right. have to be formal book learning. And so the library is a great place for that. Reading is a great yeah. place for that, right? right? And so that's what the summer learning program really is all about. It's just, it, again, getting kids excited about reading, kind of challenging them a little bit, you know, having it be a regular kind of a thing. So we do uh, extra special programs. We add in more. We have them more regularly. Right. There are, um, you know, challenges in terms of you know, signing up mm -hmm. for, for um, registering for the program and for getting that mm -hmm. um you know, getting that book log going right. and, and tracking the books. There's a bunch of prizes. Mm -hmm. uh, prizes are always great with kids, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, that's right. You can't, it can't, it can't be a bad thing, right? Right. If, if yeah. you add a little incentive there. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, they can win things like a Nintendo switch or gift cards or. Um, how old do you have to be? To, Cause I mean, I'm just not, not for all of us 40 year olds who would love a Nintendo <laughs> switch, but how, yeah. what, what is the definition of kids suddenly? <laughs> right. We can talk about that, but yeah, I mean, I think most of the, there are prizes for, for teens and for, adults okay. uh, also so everyone can participate Great. it isn't thanks for bringing that up it's not just for the kids okay um but yeah it's a uh, you know there and then for the younger kids too something that we used to do in the past that is coming back that i know people are very excited about is the treasure chest and okay. so it's basically like you come into the library and there's just a chest of little kind of trinkets mm -hmm. and, yep. and and kids get to dig in and like grab something oh, that's great. and it, yeah it just keeps it top of mind and it's something regular and mm -hmm. free for yeah. parents to do during the summer to yeah. keep their kids engaged yeah. and keep them learning um so yeah we, we usually see a, a huge participation in that program i love the juxtaposition of uh, reading a lot and getting a switch in return there's just something really fun about that <laughs> right positive reinforcement yeah, there's just really something fun about that <laughs> now in terms of it for for folks who are watching the version uh, of the show you probably have seen the website uh various times um i'm guessing that's the best place for people to go to find out more information other than, you know, to go into to one of their, uh, one of your facilities and actually talk to the branch manager there. Um, are there any important dates, anything that people should know about coming up in terms of signing up or any, anything of that nature that we want to make sure we point for folks toward? Right. Well, sign, registering for summer learning is going to happen in May. The program okay. itself happens about June 3rd, I believe. Okay. So it's like when school ends, that's when the summer learning begins. Mm -hmm. So be on the lookout in May mm -hmm. uh, and definitely, yes, on our website, that is the best, best place to go yeah. to find out all that information. Um, now, in terms of, we talked a little bit about earlier about the sort of idea of what sort of the library has become versus maybe the idea of what we, you know, thought of growing up in, you know, years we won't talk about because they feel like they were a long time ago. <laughs> um, you know, what you thought the library was then and, and versus what it is now, because that evolution is essential to communities. Um, 
you know, they're now so much more than books. And I'm, I'm kind of curious to kind of get as somebody who has a old school sort of library mindset, what it's been like to watch the library really blossom into, you know, this community center, this kind of hub for different parts of the community. Cause you talk about, it's not just, you know, go in, check out books, or it's not even just programming. Now there's so much more that you can do at libraries these days. Mm -hmm. It's, it's been fascinating. It's been amazing, you know, to go from the idea of a library where you have a librarian sitting behind a desk and who has basically the control of the knowledge, mm-hmm. uh, right? You know, yeah. she's she tended to be she <laughs> is the <laughs> only one who knows where the books are, yeah. and you must go through her. Yep. And to have it just wide open now, yeah. where it's like people can look that up on their own, mm-hmm. people can use Google, people can do all that. They can get at yeah. information now. Yeah. So librarians really had to kind of have a hard look and say, okay, what is our real role yeah, here, right. right? And so our our real role is. How do we help people access, interpret, understand that mm-hmm. information? Because yep. now you've got an overload out yeah. there, right? And so it's like, what do you do with it all? Yeah. How do you how do you even get your arms around it all? Yeah. Right, yeah. right. And it's not just the written word. It's right. so many aspects of our lives. And so yeah. that's how the library is kind of a community hub, a community center, a place for, you know, understanding. And if you need to know more about something or how right. to do something or where to go, right. people gravitate to us yeah. now. They understand that. Yeah. And you have a lot more. It's not just like books there's like databases there's legal forms there's you know you can learn languages you can yeah obviously of course yeah. there we mentioned uh, the electronic books but there's m- music movies and all kinds of stuff that that folks can can engage in and it feels like that if there's anything you need the library essentially has it would that be fair to say i i think that's a pretty pretty accurate statement actually yeah, yeah if, if we see that there that there is a need to access something particularly when it relates to someone's information needs or learning or bettering themselves right we try to provide access to that yeah. and and free access to yeah. that because not everyone can afford to subscribe to a, you know a paid database right. that is behind a firewall you know right. like a, a paywall i mean you know we can't necessarily um you know people can't afford high-speed internet even right. all of the time exactly. you know and yeah. with, that's for free we have that here we have hot spots that we check out to right. people for free so um you know and then you've got things like or we have we check out backpacks for yeah. the state parks with passes right. yep. you know so if you can't afford that pass you want to go with your family you can check it out and you go for free yeah um, so it's it's providing access to learning in so many ways, yeah. you know, in the written word, in the digital world, um, in experiential learning. Right. It's any any way we can increase that in the community. That's what we want to do. Right. And it's almost as per- this perfect merger between the idea of, you know, like you said, fostering learning and then also just providing information because there's so much more going on at libraries now. Mm-hmm. You can vote at libraries now. You know, during the pandemic, for example, mm-hmm. libraries were essential for a lot of different communities, Chesterfields included, in terms of responding to the pandemic, in terms of like, you know, meeting the needs of people who otherwise were were really isolated. Right. And and there's just so much more, it feels like, that happens at libraries now that goes far beyond simply even just the um, the learning aspect. It's almost there's so much information, so much connection, so much more community that happens there. Right. Um, that Again, that must be really interesting for somebody like you who, you know, like you said, grew up in the shelves. And, you know, like you said, your favorite job was, you know, and, and now it's like, oh, well, people can go vote at libraries. People can pay their taxes at libraries, mm-hmm. you know. Like there's a lot more that happens in libraries and at library uh, facilities now beyond than just, you know, like I said, the, the sort of standard checking out books. One of those things I want to talk about is Chesterfield Remembers, which oh, is, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I think one of the coolest ideas I've ever heard of. But for folks who may not be aware, tell me a little bit more about Chesterfield Remembers and how that works on the library side of things. All right. Well, Chesterfield Remembers is a kind of an oral history project, right? And so you have people, um, as particularly in our community, who have these stories, who the stories are amazing and they're yeah. interesting and they deserve to be remembered and they deserve to be captured. And yeah. so we didn't see that there was a vehicle for that necessarily. Right. Uh, and so, as you know, again, as part of the learning tradition here, um, we are bringing, inviting people in from the community to share their stories um, related to Chesterfield or related to their um, growing up in Chesterfield right. and um, and recording them and, and adding those to our um, digital collection yeah. um, so that anyone can access those stories yeah. and, and enjoy them. And, you know, local, local history is something that we have to pay attention to if yeah. we want it to be preserved. Otherwise, it kind of just goes away. So. Yeah, there's so much information out there and 
one of the things that if you if you if you try to go and find something specific about you know this community or that community this this specific location or that there are those gaps and the sooner we can work to fill those gaps and you know and save that that piece of it because there are those those folks with those experiences who are getting older and and just for remembers i think does a great job of sort of iding uh, a potential um, way to fill that gap so yeah you might be able to go out and find out anything you want on the internet and we're all so used to being able to go out and find out any piece of information. But some of that information relies on people's, you know, their account of something, their, their memory of it, their experience living it. And so it's so cool to think that like people can share that and have it preserved, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and basically sort of become part of the community in which it happened. I think that's just such a fascinating um, sort of experience. Now I know in terms of, um, the facilities themselves, there's some renovations, I guess, planned. I think uh, a couple of libraries that you guys have coming up. Yeah, that's very exciting. So our Midlothian library has been closed for a little while while right. they're, you know, rebuilding that, um, building it from the ground up, same location, um, like, and, but it's it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, that's due to open up later this year. Okay. Um, and, you know, I've seen the design, I've seen the plans. It's it's fantastic that they have a, a garden outside in the back for like child, a children's learning garden right. with all sorts of activities. Right. So, and it, that's such a, like a family branch. I think yeah. that, you know, the families and the kids are going to love that. So that's coming up. Uh, once that opens, um, then the La Prade library at some point is going to close. We're in the design phase for the La Prade library and they're okay. going to get a renovation. Um, it's not a full rebuild, but it's a renovation and they really do need to refresh, um, the, the kind of the interior of that building is, is showing its age. Yeah. So they're going to, there's going to be a reorientation of the entrance. There's going to be some new furnishings, new lighting, um, new setup of, of the books. I think people are going to really love that. Um, and yeah, there's some other projects planned out further beyond that but those are the two that are coming up good deal well carolyn before we let you go i want to get you out of here on this um obviously you know we talked a lot today about sort of that evolution piece and the idea that what we think of as the historical sort of aspect of a library the way it's you know always been it's just grown and and changed and and sort of really um iterated if you think about it you know these things that just make total sense like oh well of course you can go to the library and do x right it just makes sense right Mm -hmm. Uh, i'm just curious to get you sort of your point of view on what's coming down the road what's next for the library as it continues to grow i'm just curious to sort of pick your brain a little bit about um what you're what you're sort of looking forward to what's next on the horizon uh, for the library yeah, that's that's a great question. <laughs> um, I would say we're we're absolutely going to do more of the same. Um, mm-hmm. And what we're what we're focusing on now is making sure that we are reaching everybody in terms of the library. Because, like you said, yeah. the library offers so much, right. and I don't. I feel like everyone doesn't know about all of right. that, right? So we're being very very aware of knowing at this point where our card holders are, right. where they are not, right. and making sure that we are reaching out to those communities communities where maybe we don't have a lot of library use or we right. don't have the card holders and talking to them and letting them know what we have, but also listening to them and saying, what do you want us to have right. for you? You know, yeah. do we have the right things? Right. Because we've got a lot of things, but maybe we don't have all the right things. Right. So I think we're going to be doing a lot of listening over the next year. That's awesome. Well, Carolyn, thank you very much for joining us today. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Yeah, it's my pleasure. All right, let me tell you about all the ways you can check us out. You can check us on our Twitter. It's at Chesterfield VA. And on Instagram, it's Chesterfield Virginia, all one word. And you can search our Facebook page. Just search Chesterfield by the mic. Make sure to like that page so you can keep us so you go forward. Now, let me tell you about all the ways you can watch us. You can watch us on our YouTube channel, as well as on our website, Chesterfield.gov slash podcast. An audio-only version of the show is available there, as well as on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Overcast, and a whole host of other services. You can watch the show on WCCT Thursday through Sunday at 7 on the weekends at noon. That's Comcast Channel 98 and Verizon Channel 28. And lastly, you can check out chesterfield.gov slash connect with us for more ways for you to get in touch with us and for us to get in touch with you. My uh, thanks to our director, Martin Stiff, my executive producer, Teresa Boniface, and the whole crew here from Communications and Media for all that they do. So from all of us here in Chesterfield County, thanks again for making us a part of your day. We'll see you again real soon. Take good care.